Hey everybody, welcome to the Big Liberty Show, coming to you from a very special location, Gummersbach, Germany. That's right, Gummersbach, Germany. Your favorite fat boys out here in Germany, man. I'm tearing stuff up. Um, you know, I'm getting at these German folk, having them wonder, where the hell is this guy from? South Africa, that's right, that's where I'm from. Um, but I'm not alone. I'm not alone, as always. Um, I've got a very eclectic mix of uh, liberals and classical liberals from all over the world. Um, let me actually uh, do a little intro from my left to right. At the very end, weighing in at 130, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we have uh, from Mexico, Maria Jose, and she is from Mexico City, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Welcome to the show. Um, and of course, to my immediate left, I have Ms. Beanish Javed, who's from Pakistan. Uh, is it Istanbul? Or just, you said just outside Istanbul? Islamabad. Excuse me, Islamabad, Islamabad, my bad. Um, did I say Istanbul? That's like Turkey. Gobble, gobble. And of course, to my right, I have Bruno Sangono. Uh, Sa Sangono. Sanogo. 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 That's right. Sorry. Uh, Bruno, of course, is the chairperson of the. Um, remind me, Bruno, is, is it a union? Simplex. It's a union. This is great. And uh, you're with BBC Afrique, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm glad to have you on the show. Guys, we're going to do a very quick show. Um, a lot of people have been, you know, watching my few vlogs here and there, watching my tweets, wondering what is Big Daddy doing in Germany? And, uh, you know, who are these people that he's with, right? So let's begin by just a quick um, story as to who you are uh, and what brings you to Germany. So I'm going to bring, uh, I'm going to start on Bruno's side. Uh, Bruno, who are we talking to? Where are you from? Well, thank you, Big Daddy, to have me on your show. I'm... Uh... Uh, Bruno Sanogo, um, I was born in Burkina Faso and uh, I work in Senegal as a journalist and uh, as a union leader, uh, this union called Sempix, BBC yep. Africa. Um, tell me a bit about Sempix, just very briefly. Uh, what does it do? You, know, you, you mentioned it's a union. Is it a union for journalists and media people? Yeah, yeah. Sempix is the, the main union of journalism and uh, uh, of journalists and uh, um, technical support yeah. in journalism and communication and uh, uh, in Senegal. So we do have a section of this big union in uh, uh, BBC Afrique as part of media operating in Senegal. Then uh, I'm a chairperson of this uh, uh, section there. Awesome. Yep. Hey man, glad to have you. Uh, guys, I'm going to move to this side. Beanish, I'm going to start with you. Uh, who is Beanish Javed? What do you do? What brings you here to Germany? Um, first of all, thank you, Big Teddy, for having me at your show. Mm. It's indeed a pleasure. Um, I'm Beanish Javed from Pakistan, and uh, I work as a research uh, associate slash economist uh, in a public policy think tank based in Islamabad. Um, and we basically uh, work for free, open, and prosperous Pakistan. This is our vision, the, uh, the vision of our uh, organization. And we work on various social and economic uh, issues uh, currently prevailing in Pakistan. And we basically give policy suggestions and reform proposals to the different tiers of government, like yeah. local, provincial, and sometimes even federal government. Yeah, um, we, yeah basically, that's more or less yeah. what we do. And, and, you know, I, I want to just quickly go into this before I come to you, Maria. Um, you know, you work in a think tank in Pakistan. I'm um, to assume, of course, that you, I mean, we're all liberals here, but I mean, your particular brand of liberalism, how, how do you view the world? You know, how, if you were to, for example, talk about the relationship with government, um, and again, you don't have to be academic, but just from a general perspective, do you, and in relation to Pakistan, would you be calling for something like more state intervention and things? Like, how would you view the world generally? We are not against government in any shape, way, or form. I think government should be there. Yeah. However, government's role should be very much defined. Yeah. Uh, and we are in for limited government intervention yeah. in this market, in the economy. Yeah. And when we say, basically, our outlook, uh, the outlook of our organization is that government should be there, but it should perform only three duties. It should, uh, you know, uh, keep the 
like the rule of law, that is it's one of its duties, yep. and to ensure uh, basically uh, protection of property rights. Absolutely. That is another one of its responsibilities. Yeah. Um, uh, but other than that, it, sh it should have limited intervention as to uh, like, uh, you know, um, making choices for individuals. There should be liberty for individuals to make their own choices. There should be freedom of expression, freedom of choice, um, and uh, this Unfortunately, Pakistan is far from that. Yeah, as of yet. I hear you, uh, and, and I want to move quickly over to uh, Maria because Maria, I mean, we we've been having these conversations, you know, in the past two weeks here. Um, but before I get into any of that, Maria Hossein, who is she? Tell us about Mexico City. What does she do there, and what is she doing here in Germany? So yeah, thank you for having me. Um, as you mentioned, yes, my name is Maria Jose, which is a uh, name that comes together in Spanish, but <laughs> internationally everyone just decides to call you Maria. It's nice. Okay. Um, yeah, I am from Mexico City, the big city, um, and in between 23 million people. Um, I work for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation mm -hmm. in Mexico. Shout out to the FNF, who, yeah. by the way, we're here on their yeah. behest. Yeah. FNF Pakistan. You go, girl. <laughs> so, um, um, the one in Mexico is the regional office for Latin America, yeah. so my boss is actually the director for Latin America, Mr. Siegfried Herzog, he was also director in Southeast Asia, India, yeah. Philippines, so he's amazing. And I have the pleasure of working with him, coordinating all the activities for the Mexico project where we fight for a rule of law, open markets, open society. Mm. We also integrated this year the topic of migration. Yeah, we are also which is very topical for you guys yeah. in, in that part of the world. And I suppose for other parts of the world too, but migration right now, as you guys would know, is a topical issue in Central and South America, and of course, North America with Mr. Trump. Um, but sorry, I, I disturbed your train of thought. Yeah? yeah, it's great. Um, so yeah, we decided to um, start on those topics because yeah. of the importance of it. And we are also now into um, environment but more into like digitalization innovation for smart cities mobilization and so on which is very important in a city you know of that size yeah <laughs> absolutely guys i'm going to segue the conversation and bring it towards um essentially while we have this at this um seminar now we've had two weeks of a conversation a rolling conversation around populism and very briefly i want to go to each of you around uh, you know, firstly, what does populism look like in your country? Maybe you can mention a particular politician if you want to, or just generally a, a, um, a political movement that may be growing in your part of the world. But what, is, what has populism looked like for you guys in your part of the world? And Binish, I'm actually going to begin with you, um, because I know Pakistan has a very uh, fractured political history, and it's somewhat calmish now, but there's still those very strong roots of populism growing in Pakistan, aren't they? Uh, yes, I agree with you. Uh, currently, um, last year we had our uh, federal elections and uh, a very popular party called PTI, uh, it won uh, the elections. And now our current prime minister, uh, Imran Khan, he's, he's a very populist leader, let me just say this very clearly. Uh, the, thing, uh, the reason for this is basically that uh, he actually uses the religious and national sentiments. Uh, that is his basic agenda, to use the religious and national sentiments to um, you know, gain the emotional support of the majority of the population, specifically the youth. That is his target group. Uh, and because uh, previously he was a national hero, as right. in because he was a cricketer. Yeah, he was the captain of your cricket yeah. club. We were actually talking about him on the previous show. Yeah. In 1992, so since then he was like a national hero for Pakistan. So he already had a very like, um, you know, famous and popular image right from the beginning. And it was easy for him to enter into politics. Mm. And uh, after like 10 or 15 years of uh, being in politics, he finally won the elections last year. And now that he's in power, as, as most populists do, um, I'm just going to be honest that he's just making big claims mm. that I will end corruption in 90 days. Yeah. Like in three months, three months is not enough to basically end 
or change anything. Absolutely, especially so in a country like Pakistan. Yeah, that's sort of I mean, population. we have a lot of inherent issues. We have a lot of micro and macroeconomic issues that need to be dealt with. We have public debt, which is rising. We have taxation issues. We have structural issues, a lot of issues, right? Uh, our human capital is low, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, no, he's not doing much in this regard. All he's doing is just making big claims. Yeah. And in fact, um, if anything, the macroeconomic situation is deteriorating. Our Pakistan rupee is depreciating against yeah. dollar. The currency is becoming weaker day by day. Oh boy, um, is that a story we, we all know in the developing yeah. world? Yeah, and oh, but then he comes on the television and he just gives like a speech uh, targeted to the entire nation and saying that I will do please bear with me you have to be supportive you yeah. chose me i will prove it give me time give me this you know all those populist i'm going to move it on um and i'm going to come to you bruno because um being interested in the nail on the head isn't there the idea of the populist leader who makes wild claims wild promises often with very little accountability as to whether they keep those promises or not do you see the same thing in uh, senegal or Burkina faso well uh mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously we, we do have um, some populist ideas in uh, Burkina Faso. Let me focus first in, in, in Burkina Faso. Yeah. We, we've got this politician called Ablase Wedraogo. He was trying to instrumentalize, you know, um, ethnicism, to put ethnicism in the, in the politics, um, claiming that, pretending that because he is from the, uh, the big ethnic group he, he might be, he is naturally uh, aimed to be in power, yeah. to govern, no way that uh, someone from the minority or any other group lead to, to the, the country. But of course, and he has lost the election, fortunately, fortunately he has lost the election. And coming to Senegal, which is close to Burkina Faso, all those countries are in West Africa, really, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the ECOWAS, right? Yeah, on the yeah. ECOWAS. Which is the regional yeah. body, like, almost like we have Econom SADC in, yeah, in yeah, South yeah, Africa. Yeah. Economic or West African yeah. uh, region. So uh, coming to Senegal now, so, um, well, the populist voice I heard was about the um, um, the former president of, uh, of, of the country, called Abdullah Wad, wanting to bring his son in the politics to, uh, to, to make him become the, 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 the president as if we are in monarchy or yeah. something like that. Wad to uh, Senegal. <laughs> yeah, facing by this time the current president who wasn't a president, who was in opposition, who has himself under his government, he said that uh, uh, Macky Sall is like a slave. He is not <laughs> able to, to be in this <laughs> country. And uh, the Senegalese took that as insult and they threw out his son. Yeah. And they put Macky Sall on power. That, that how populists may look like yeah. in, in this part of the Africa francophone. And, and, and look, we'll, we'll come back to that and we'll, we'll come back to Pakistan in terms of just the, the overall picture and whatever the signs we should be looking at. But talk to us about Mexico. Let me actually let you do the talking. Talk to us about Mexico. Do you see a rise in populism? If so, what does it look like? What is the face of it? Um, yeah, I totally agree that right now in Latin America and of course the US, we're in the eye of the hurricane. Um, I will just uh, give you a little background on Mexico. Like Hit us. We were um, 70 years under the same party rule and then until 2000 we saw a change and there was actually an alternative in, in the power. Um, they lasted for 12 years and um, actually that's when Mexico became like a freer country, um, international trade, um, open societies, they were also for, um, I don't know, integration of um, minorities and so on, so we became like more prosperous country, right? Um, then um, the old ruling party of these 70 years came back to power um, and, well, violence struck, struck back. So we had a lot of issues of insecurity, a um, lot of forced disappearances and so on. And, um, well, people were not very happy with their return of this power who promised to be a new party, right? So then 
Um, there was, at least in Mexico, a sense of um, fear, of like being tired of having the same over and over again. And suddenly this leader who tried to be president already three times before and lost, um, shows up himself like he's going to be the savior of Mexico. He's yeah. going to be the one who um, takes the poor people into consideration and actually um, erase poverty from the country, create an amnesty so that there can be security and everyone can feel safe going out in the parks, um, to be a prosperous economy by boosting again our oil and our petrol because why should we import these things if we are producers of it? So many things that we know are very, very difficult and just like Pakistan, it really sounds because he also promised I will end corruption in a hundred days, right? Mm. So these are goals that are <laughs> impossible. Not yeah. Yeah. Are goals. impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And only people who are so desperate for hope can believe in it. Mm. So then they relate totally to this person, to this leader, who is a savior, and they're like, I'm going to vote for this person, and I, I, I want to choose him because I believe in him. Mm. So it's, it's just like a religion. You follow this, uh, like if you were blind, you follow him and everything that he says is correct. Mm. So this guy has been six months in presidency, and he has an interesting technique of legitimiz legitimizing himself. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, I believe in democracy, so I make pop popular like consults. So I raise the question of, okay, people of Mexico, do you want to build, um, like, to keep on with the construction of the new airport? And then people vote. Of course, these are not well organized. They are not legal. They are just tables, and people go and vote yes or no. And then he says, well, the people voted, and they voted, no, we don't want the airport. So airport canceled. And what happens when you have contracts of millions of dollars? Well, people, investors, no longer trust, yeah. right? Yeah. So now you see a flow out of in investments yeah. out of the country for these type of decisions. And it's a way to legitimize himself, mm -hmm. because he's like, oh, it wasn't my decision. The people voted for it. Mm. Democracy is yeah. what we are what we're having in Mexico, mm. right? But, but that's not how it works. Well, it's a perversion of democracy, it isn't is, it? It um, is, totally. And he keeps on in other topics, for example, as you have said, migration. Right now, there's a, he has majority on the Congress. So now there is, it's very worried what's happening in Mexico, and I am afraid that the international arena is not looking at it, mm -hmm. because from going to an established young democracy, we are going towards uh, initiatives of law mm -hmm. to um, in some way control elections and people should ask for re-election. It, it shouldn't be an initi initiative that comes from your government. And in this case, it's very worrisome when your own leader or president says, oh, we should initiate re-election, mm -hmm. right? I mean, shouldn't we be the ones deciding that? Yeah. Guys, you know, you're all raising, and as we move towards maybe the tail end of our conversation, um, there, there are clearly, clearly similarities um, in, in the type of burgeoning leadership that we're seeing develop, whether it's in Pakistan, Mexico, or even Burkina or Senegal. Um, a wild-like character, big on promises, unrealistic, but they appeal to the sentiments of, of a desperate people, right? Um, and I think we share this as people who live in developing economies. You know, we, we depending on you know what it is, you know, Absolutely. we know the face of poverty. It's very real, and those people are very desperate. South Africa is no different. Um, you know, when we have a character like Julius Malema, for example, who can stand in front of an audience and say, "Hey, you know." Once we get into power, or right now, we need to cut the throat of whiteness, as he often says. You know, these guys will say wild things to elicit a wild reaction. Um, 
and very serious issues that we face, you know, when they, they, they always propose these weird, either they ignore them yeah. or they, they propose these weird solutions. So we've got a big problem of crime and murder and violence in South Africa, uh, where also, uh, which affects everyone, by the way. Um, but there are certain vulnerable groupings because of maybe where they live, for example, our rural area. Um, some quick context. We're in Gummersbach right now in Germany, which is a relatively rural part of Germany, right? So you're pretty far out there. Um, but here, I don't think any of us here have ever felt in danger or, you know, we've been walking out, going to the local little town, um, guys have been having drinks, etc, etc. But in South Africa, you wouldn't necessarily see that. Our rural areas are very, very unsafe and we have a lot of farm murders. Um, in particular because, you know, of where they live. They live far out, they live alone usually, or, you know, um, and they're easier targets. Um, but we have a government which either ignores it and um, says nothing about it, or if they do speak about it, it's actually to inflame the, the, the especially the racial component of it. Um, so we, I think all of us have some experience of populist uh, politicians, whether they're on the uh, extreme left or the extreme right, but where I want us to end the conversation is how we can beat them. Because I often say when it comes to South Africa, there is this very large um, middle, right? Whether it's center left or center right, who are actually very moderate people, they're very reasonable. They understand that the extreme guys, whether they're on the left or right, are basically douchebags, if I can put it that way, populist douchebags. And the issue then becomes how do you unite that middle, right? Um, and I'm gonna pose that question to all of you. And you will have two minutes to sort of give some thoughts and, and uh, see what you have to say. But how do you unite that middle ground? Those people who are actually like, look, I don't believe those populist messages. I don't believe um, this guy, but you know, how do we actually get uh, the, the right sort of government into power? And how do we bring freedom and prosperity into our individual nation? So um, I'm gonna begin with you, Sammy. Um, or Bruno, excuse me, uh, we've been having interchangeable names here. No um, yes, yes. And then just Marie was complaining about it now, it's Maria Jose. We were all saying Maria. Um, also my name. No. I, I'm going to come to you, because I don't know what the picture is like in Senegal or Burkina, um, but I'm willing to venture that you have some ideas around how you build a freedom-loving and a prosperous Burkina Faso or Senegal. How do we do that in that part of the world? Well, um, and this is actually uh, a big job being doing for quite uh, several years by civil society. Yeah, very important by civil society. Yeah, getting to raise some issue uh, uh, like education, it might be a priority of the government to yep. put money on this and uh, also to, uh, to well-being. So what I want to focus on in Burkina Faso, the country is um, struggling now with insecurity. Mm -hmm. Which kind of insecurity? It is terrorism, mm -hmm. I would say, in the north part of the country. Uh, um, military, gendarme and policemen are are targeting even the teachers somehow are, are fleeing this this part of region. So um, for me to give the, to build a free country, you have to provide them security. Absolutely. Maria Jose was talking Fully about agreed. security in, in Mexico right now. But this kind of security, people will be free to go to school. Mm -hmm. People will be free to go to the hospital, <coughs> people will be free to do any kind of business they want to do there. And it is not the same, the same problem in, in Senegal. Mm -hmm. That is pretty much about the open market as value of liberalism and, to, and uh, uh, the president uh, Macky Sall is uh, uh, himself in the international liberal, among the international liberal president. Mm -hmm. but, one fact is that what the citizen uh, of Senegal told me, what they say, uh, as I'm a journalist, I used to discuss with them. Yeah. Um, this open market is not so open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like mid-open market uh, because they say that uh, Makisal have favored the, favorized the, the French investor instead of other investors. Yes. There are some um, 
uh, how do you call it, a proposal if they open the, the market for uh, a type of infrastructure, uh, you may, there is not equality in competition on that. That is what people don't like actually on how things are running there. Mm. So, so people want the ability to trade freely, to open up the market to competition, yeah, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Um, and of course, to allow people to be able to engage in that with, by having a good education so they can actually be a part of the formal economy. Absolutely. But I just wanted to get to, and I'll get to you ladies just now, the issue of security, because it's such a key issue on the African continent generally, yeah. You cannot have a free and prosperous society if government is not playing its role. And what are the, th what are the roles of government, basically? There's three broad roles. One is to protect its citizens from foreign aggression. The idea of having an army, a diplomatic corps, um, something that, that reserves uh, the integrity of a nation state. And number two is to protect us from internal threats. So a criminal, someone who wants to steal uh, property or violate your life, right? Or life and property, essentially. So having a police force, um, yeah. you know, correctional services, Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the third one, which is a very important one, you kind of spoke to it now, is the idea of um, you know regulating our disputes. So I mean, if you live in a country of two hundred, what's a million people plus, um, you know, Mexico City, twenty something million people in just a city alone. Um, I don't know what the population is. Senegal is uh, quite 15, 15 million people. Fifteen million or so. And Burkina Faso is uh, about. Um, uh, 18 million. So the point I'm making is if you have those sort of millions of people with different cultures, different views, of course there'll be conflict and, and you know, uh, issues between us. So you need a judiciary, something that arbitrates our disputes yeah. um, in order to, to have a functional. Those are the three liberal values essentially around how you build um, or that begin to answer the question of how you build a prosperous and a viable nation. And you know, we, we will we'll pick this up because, guys, just very quickly, all of the faces you see here will become, hopefully, regular contributors to the Big Liberty Show, giving us uh, insight from their part of the world. Uh, so we'll be crossing to them in um, upcoming shows. So, guys, as I maybe move it on to the ladies, and we have a similar, in fact, the same question to you guys, you know, how do we beat the populace in your country? and unite that middle that I speak of. And maybe, hey, maybe it doesn't exist in your country. Maybe there is no rational middle and you have a bigger task in your hands. But the question remains, how do we beat the populists in Pakistan? What needs to happen if Beanish became prime minister? Uh, well, uh, fortunately, I guess, we do have that rational middle class or middle people who are like, and we have a good majority of them. Like, at least you can say that 55% of the people are quite rational uh, in the sense now after our Prime Minister took over for, for the past 8-9 months they have seen like even the people who voted for him now they have changed their sides right <laughs> they're like eh maybe not him <laughs> so I guess the way to beat the populist force and movement in my country is for sure uh, sensitizing the general public yeah. and uh, how do we sensitize them how do we raise awareness among the general public that we need a more liberal movement in our country that is obviously through campaigns mm. uh, and I think it's the responsibility or uh, job of the civil society organizations mm. as well as a lot of uh, private sector think tanks and NGOs um, our public policy think tanks that are operating in my country and we have quite a few we have like uh, 10 12 very good think tanks uh, which are basically working for the same cause and I think if we all put aside our differences, like I'm just talking about the think tanks mm -hmm. operating in Pakistan, and we collaborate together and work for a bigger cause, such as to be the populists. I think we can do that. We have the potential, but we need sufficient resources for that. Individual think tanks, maybe it would be very difficult to arrange massive or large campaigns, given our own resources. Mm -hmm. uh, we are always looking for more funds and donors, maybe from international organizations. Mm -hmm. They can sponsor us. Uh, for the good cause in our countries uh, because we kind of support that liberal ideology as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and one more thing I would like to add is that it's also very important to engage the media. Once we build that momentum, ultimately yeah. the politicians, higher up leaders would realize that... Uh, a ground swell up. Fully yeah. agreed. Yeah. Um, Maria Jose, a ground swell up, um, a whole of society approach, is that the same um, metric required for Mexico? So now I am Maria Jose. You, you saw, yeah, man, you saw what your big boy was doing, you know, getting it right. Yes. 
Um, well, in, in Mexico it's actually very difficult because right now the opposition is very, very completely fragmented. Mm -hmm. Of course, the people no longer believe in the parties yeah. and people no longer want to see political parties. Yeah. So um, what we're doing right now at the foundation is um, exactly what Binish said and mm -hmm. it's, um, for example, for the topic of migration, we knew that we had to do something you know, like um, because of, of what's happening in the U.S. and all the caravans that are coming from Central America, mm. and there are even like people from Africa coming to reach the U.S. That's so right. We knew that we had to do something about it. So what we do is like we gather people from the civil society, from the academia, from the political spectrum, like uh, senators, some people who are actually in top positions within the commissions of migration in the Senate, the mm -hmm. Mexican Senate. And then we gather also um, like uh, people directly involved with migrants, right? So we gather all of them in a workshop and then it's like a solution room. So then we give them, okay, this is the problem of integration of migrants in Mexico. What do we do with all the Central Americans that are arriving? What do we do with the Mexicans that are deported from the US yes. who are now American Mexicans? You yeah. know, they're, they're, it's a different identity. Yeah. So. Um, I think this is this is the way like to gather all the people from all the different spectrum to reach like the goals that we're, we're fighting for. And I think it's also very important we don't do it directly in my project in Mexico, but I think it's very important that um, in a way we also have to recognize that we failed at some point, right? We wouldn't be at this point if we hadn't forgotten those who didn't vote for us. So I think liberalism also has to find a way to reach those niche areas that we left behind. And now these shapes decide to open up. Sorry guys, it's quite distracting, but do continue. <laughs> so yeah, I think um, this is very important, you know, because these are the voters, the people that don't trust us because we forgot them. So liberalism is not just for elites, it's not a club of people discussing ideas. Liberalism is a way of life where everyone fits in. And I think it's very important to take this to all the people that feel outside of it. Mm. Guys, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, as you can see, the room is beginning to have a life of its own. Um, but guys, I really am thankful for each and every single one of you who have joined me on this episode of The Big Liberty Show. Um, but maybe I just final word, um, if you want, um, how do people reach you on social media if, if you want them to reach you at all? Um, I'll, I'll come on the side. Uh, Sammy, are you on um, are you on social media? Yeah, yeah, I do use Facebook, I yep. do use uh, um, Twitter, Instagram, and all the social media. Sammy Nimeno. Awesome, awesome. I will put the, 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 that information on the screen. Beanish, I don't know if you want people to reach you, but um, <laughs> and no, do not slide into her DM. I will be watching all of you. Um, <laughs> Uh, Binish, how do people get you? Well, uh, I'll just put out my Facebook <laughs> uh, there. Uh, I'll tell him and he can put it in the description <laughs> link below. All right. You can reach out to me on Facebook, uh, but for Insta, I'm sorry. It's too personal. <laughs> I'm watching y'all, as I said. Um, of course, Maria, how do we reach you? Um, I'm mostly active on Twitter, so mm -hmm. I will leave my Twitter on it, and then you can follow everything that's going on in Latin America. Absolutely. Guys, as I said, thank you so much for watching, and um, thank you to my uh, co- uh, guests or okay, hosts, since we're all guests <laughs> in this country. Um, uh, yeah, guys, thank you. Remember to support the Big Liberty Show. Uh, you know, I'm wholly dependent on you, the viewer, the fan, um, for getting me to locations like these. I mean, hey, who'd have thought I'd be in Gummersbach, Germany, of all places? But um, let's keep the Big Liberty Show running. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it getting into the conversation, whether it's in South Africa or Pakistan or wherever. Um, because I feel like liberalism and essentially the, the fight for liberty, which is my mission, is something which is far greater than even you and I in South Africa. We also need to have an international perspective on these issues. Guys, thank you so much to the guys who got us out here, to the Frederick Nauman Foundation. Shout out, shout out to you guys. And of course, to the Institute of Race Relations, who are my friends and partners on my mission. Uh, guys, as always, you can support the show and your favorite fat boy by uh, SMSing your name to to 32823. Uh, terms and conditions do apply, and SMS will cost you one rand. Or hey, 
Maybe you're thinking SMSs, what is that? I'm a, I'm a millennial, I don't do SMSs. Well, you can find us online at www.irr.org.za forward slash join. And you can sign up a monthly debit order there of between, hey, 70 or 90 Rand a month, as do other people. Guys, thank you so much for watching. You can find me on all my social media. We'll have that on the screen and we'll probably link them below the video. And remember to like, share, subscribe to the show. And I will see you guys on that next one. Cheers.